Hello and welcome to Positive Forward Motion. This is your host, Denise Scattergood. Each week I bring you topics with how-to steps to empower, motivate, and inspire you to be your very best both personally and professionally. In this week's episode, I am so excited because I'm talking with Roz Savage. Roz's story of positive forward motion will inspire you to face your fears and to live your life with passion and purpose. So sit back, try to relax as you listen to how Roz dreamed big and followed her positive forward motion steps to make her dream a reality. Hello, Roz. Thank you so much for being with us today and sharing your amazing story of positive forward motion. And before we dive deep and even get in, just say hello and tell the listeners a little bit about yourself. Well, it's a real pleasure to be here with you today, Denise. I've been looking forward to it. And the name of your podcast sort of makes me smile because I suppose I'm best known for my ocean rowing adventures. I've rowed alone across the Atlantic, the Pacific and the Indian. And anybody listening to this who rows crew will know that as rowers, we actually face backwards in the boat. So although today we're absolutely talking about positive forward motion, I've put an enormous amount of effort um, over the course of many years into, in fact, moving backwards as fast as possible. (laughs) <laughs> I love that. And, you know, I've, I've read your book, Stop Drifting and Start Rowing, probably three or four times. It's every time I'm fist pumping and so excited. And there's a moment in the book where you talk about the self-help exercise that you did that really was so impactful and it got you going. So tell us a little bit about that, please. Yeah, um, it's a powerful exercise. So maybe this should come with some sort of government health warning warning that uh, this exercise can seriously change your life, but only for the better, in my experience. So it was towards the end of the 11 years that I spent working as a management consultant in the City of London. And I had very much come to the conclusion that even though I didn't yet know what I wanted to do when I grew up, um, I was pretty certain that management consulting was not it. Uh, So I was really trying to figure out, so what do I want to do? And in desperation, I turned to self-help books and especially that classic, The Seven Habits of Highly Effective People by Stephen Covey. And the second habit that he mentions is to begin with the end in mind. In other words, to start as you as you mean to go on and specifically how you mean to finish up. And he suggests that you do an exercise in which you imagine the ultimate end, which is the day that will come to us all um, when one day we will be in a big box at the front of a chapel somewhere and it'll be our funeral. And he invites the reader to imagine two different scenarios for this. The first one is the scenario that we want. What do we want people to be saying about us? How do we want to be remembered? And then the second one is what will they actually be saying about us if we carry on as we are? And when I sat down and I did this exercise, it revealed to me that I was heading in pretty much 180 degrees the wrong direction if I wanted to end up with the kind of life that I could be proud to have lived. And I realized I was going to have to make some really big changes if I wasn't going to end up shortly before I'm in the box um, with a a load of regrets for the paths not taken. For so many of us, you know, we dream big. There's many listeners out there that are uncomfortable. They they don't really understand why they're uncomfortable. Maybe they haven't done that searching and they're looking for happiness through so many other sources out there, things and, and people to make them happy. And it begins with us and inside. And you say, dream big and change your life. And I love that. And many of us, and I'm sure many of the listeners out there go, but I do dream big, but I'm I'm stuck and I don't even know how to get started. That's why I, I've always followed the philosophy. And even in my life, as I was creating my podcast, I wanted my podcast to be done or get started a year ago. And there were many times I thought, oh, it's not done in time. Oh, I'm never going to get it done. And then I remember to take my own advice, positive forward motion. As long as I take a little step in the right direction, I'm getting closer to my goals and my dreams. 
So when the audience listens to you and gets to know Roz, and as I get to know Roz, I'm like, oh my goodness. I mean, all right, you had a big dream. You're going to row an ocean and then another and then another, and then you did it. And just looking at that can be so just insurmountable. And where do I even start? And this is my dream, but you did more than dream. You took action and it started with one little positive forward motion step and then another and another and another. So maybe elaborate a little bit on how you broke that down to even take that first step in that direction. Wow, you've raised so many great points there. And I'm going to try and, there were so many thoughts coming up in my mind. I'm going to see how many of them I can manage to remember. Um, I know I definitely used to be in that mindset of looking outside of myself for happiness and fulfillment. There was that I'll be happy when I pass that exam or when I get that promotion or when I've earned this much money or when I start dating that guy or get married to that guy. And it's so easy to pin our happiness onto these things outside of ourselves. But the problem with that is that we can't control the things outside of ourselves. So a big part of my growing up process was to realize that I had to look to myself uh, and look inside in order to make myself happy, that I couldn't make anybody else responsible for my happiness or blameworthy for my lack of happiness. And, you know, I I still have to remind myself of that, that I can't make other people responsible for my emotions. So then how did I go about making this crazy big dream into a reality? Well, if I could just wind back a little bit from that, because I I think I need to explain. So after doing that obituary exercise, I wish I could tell you that I went into the office the next day and quit my lousy job and told my boss where to stick it and strode out to live a life of adventure. Um, But it took a little bit longer. Um, I think there's often a processing period between starting to dream the big dreams. I'd really started to conjure up with that fantasy funeral scene. Sometimes it can take a while for our lives to line up with that vision. In my case, I would say it took at least two or three years. But once I'd done that exercise, that vision just refused to go away. And I I knew that that was the life that I was meant to be living. Eventually, I did find the courage to quit my job. And actually, my marriage ended soon after that. So I really was, as Janis Joplin would say, you know, in that place of freedom when there's nothing left to lose. Uh, But that was tremendously empowering because it really set me free to set my own path. And my first adventure was to spend three months traveling around Peru. And it was while I was there and spending time with people up in the Andes and hearing about the impacts of climate change on the glaciers up in the mountains there that I had my environmental awakening. And... I was a bit late getting the memo on climate change, I suppose, and all the other things that we're doing to our earth. And when I found out about it, there was this mixture of embarrassment that I'd been so ignorant in the past, but also I was just on fire. I absolutely had to do something to try and make a difference. This just seemed to me like my calling, like the thing that I couldn't not do. I just had to do my best to raise awareness and hopefully inspire some action. But I didn't know what to do. I feel like these were sort of all necessary steps. And I'm not saying that everybody will go through the same steps. But for me, that obituary exercise that led to me realizing I wanted to lead a purpose-led life rather than a possession or a money-led life, and then finding my mission in sustainability But even then, that didn't immediately lead to rowing across oceans because I knew I wanted to do something for this purpose, but I didn't know what it would be. I was just a washed up management consultant and there was no obvious thing that I could do to make a difference. So it was after several months of holding this question, what can I do to be of service to this cause, that I was just driving along in my car on a long drive one day and I do a lot of my best I would say thinking in the car but in a way it's a bit like stopping thinking it's like my conscious mind shuts up and my 
my subconscious or my heart or my soul or whatever you want to call it can actually get a word in edgeways. And this crazy idea popped into my head. I had become aware of this very obscure fringe activity of rowing across oceans several months previously. And at the time, it hadn't particularly struck me as a fun thing to do. Um, But suddenly, all of these pieces of the puzzle just clicked into place. And this absurd idea popped into my head that, heck, I knew how to row. I could row across oceans and use that as my platform to raise environmental awareness. And I think there was that real sense of my heart going, hell yeah, that is it. That's the answer. That's what we're going to do. And then my brain doing what our brains do so well, which is they try to keep us safe. So the brain jumps in and goes, here's a million reasons why this is an absolutely horrible idea. So I'd say for about a week, the heart was going, let's get going. And the brain's going, no, 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 bad idea. But eventually the heart persuaded the head that actually this did tick all the boxes and that all of these changes that I'd made in my life had really been leading up to this decision. And so I got to the point, uh, and I do recommend this, if you have a big dream and you're finding it really hard to get out of the starting blocks, start out just going, what if I was going to do this? What would I need to read? Who would I need to talk to? uh, What things would I need to acquire? What courses would I need to take? So I just started thinking, if I was going to row across an ocean to raise environmental awareness, then what would my to-do list be? And I started to write this, what turned into a very long list, but I'd broken it down to such a level of fine detail that there was really nothing on there that seemed too impossible. And so the whole thing started to seem frighteningly doable and from then on it was a matter of going yeah I'm going to try and do this and just start working my way down the list ticking off all of those items and not allowing myself too much time to stop and think and doubt about it but really just to become unstoppable just to keep on going That is such a good message for the listeners as well, because you took on such a huge dream. And to back up a little bit, I love where you shared that, you know, the habits of highly successful people, and we're talking about doing our passion and what's important to us. And until we are comfortable with ourselves, we are looking for outside things to make us happy. And and I wrote down as we were speaking, one of my favorite quotes that I've been carrying around forever. It's a scrappily little piece of paper. I found it on a calendar probably about 25 years ago. And it goes on a vision board. And then I wind wind up putting it in a purse or a wallet. But it says, if we don't believe in love and accept ourselves, we're going to try to find someone else to do that for us. And that's such a great first step because Mm. to have that belief in ourselves. And we go, I am special. I am put here for a reason. And my feelings and my purpose and my angst and my, you know, as I, as you're sharing your story, I'm getting excited thinking, I'm sure there are nights that you couldn't sleep and you're having these wild, exciting dreams. And this is, you're feeling such a passion of purpose. And for the listeners, it doesn't need to be about rowing around the world. It's your passion and your purpose. And then to stop and break out these steps to say, what if, What if I decide to do that and start to write that out and then write out the to-do list? And when you look at it, I love what you share here. When you're looking at your list in detail, it's doable. You can do it because our minds can swirl and make us feel so unempowered sometimes that, oh my gosh, it's too much. I can't even, but just to stop and write down the steps and then you look at it and you go, oh my goodness, this can be done. I can make it happen. And and you went ahead and did it. And I know it changed your life and it's changing the lives of so many others. And once we take that action, as you did, it can get really rough. And okay, this is what I decided to do. Here I go. And then you're in it going, "Uh uh-oh, what did I do? And at this moment, it's not the time to give up. It is that time that I'm also always reminding myself it's positive forward motion, Denise. Just keep moving forward. 
Because once we get out the other side through the pain and through the tough times, that's where I have found the reward is so much better. And they're the stories. Like I, I often laugh. Someone just emailed me yesterday or texted me something about a tough time they were going through and they felt so silly about it. And it's so terrible. And I was like, that's okay. It's going to be a story and it's going to be the best story afterwards. So just keep moving forward. It's not the time to sit down and give up. It's the time to look at that and go, oh, this is going to be a story. So <laughs> share a little bit about how, you know, when it came became so difficult and so hard for you, what did you tap into? How did you keep up that positive forward motion and keep putting that or in the water and continue to press forward. Yeah, and you know, even before I left the harbour, it was already hard uh, because it took me 14 months of absolutely flat out preparations to acquire the rowboat, get it all fitted out for an ocean crossing. I had to be completely self-reliant while I was out there. So I had to have a water maker and an electrical system and obviously lots of food. And there were so many times during those preparations where there would be a shortage of money. And I don't think it's just my story around money. I think it's a fairly common story that lack of financial resources can undermine our resolve like almost nothing else. <laughs> it could be really undermining. And I just really had to keep going in, in faith, not fear. Uh, and yeah, most of the sleepless nights were actually about, was I going to be able to pay the bills um, to the boat builders and and everybody else? So I think the fact that I had really felt so called to do this, that moment in the car, it had been like my call to adventure. I kind of felt that um, the universe was there for me, that it wanted me to do this, which did absolutely not mean that it was going to be easy or plain sailing. And I think it was it was that belief that really helped me to keep on going. I've, I've done a lot of thinking about courage because people have often said, wow, you must be so brave to have set out across oceans all on your own for months and months at sea. And from the inside, I don't feel like a particularly brave person. Um, courage is certainly not the absence of fear. There are times when our brain is doing its job very well and telling us all the good reasons to be afraid. But my theory is that when your motivation is bigger than your fear, then you're able to feel the fear but move forward anyway. So even now, even though I'm happily retired from the ocean rowing, when I start feeling wobbly about something, but I know it's actually a really important thing for me to do, I look at how I can pump up my motivation or how I can get a grip on my fear. And normally with the fear, I find that when I turn around and look at the fear directly, it immediately shrinks. It's when I'm trying to run away from it. The fear is like this, this big, scary shadow looming on the wall. It seems much bigger than it, it really is. When I turn around and look at it and address the problem, I mean, take the example of money. Um, I've definitely been through times when money has been very scarce and the temptation was to stick my head in the sand and not not look at the bank balance. But yeah, that really doesn't help the situation kind of got to muster your courage and turn around and look straight at it and figure out a way to deal with it. And then also to pump up the motivation. So I was, I had these twin motivations of the environmental mission and also at the same time, a really strong desire to continue to spread my wings. I felt that I'd let go of so many of my self-limiting beliefs already to have survived without a steady income for several years by this point, to survive without a husband to prop me up, um, to survive without other people telling me what to do or how to do it or asking me to jump through their hoops. I'd already come such a long way and I was really curious to see what more I was capable of. And the only way to find that out, I mean, you don't find out what you're capable of by sitting at home on the sofa. <laughs> You've got to get out there. And I love that quote by, um, <laughs> there's a lot I don't love about Margaret Thatcher, but she did have some good quotes. And one of them was um, that a woman is like a tea bag. You don't know how strong she is until you put her in hot water. 
I love that one too. Isn't that the truth? And and when you shared, keep going in faith and not fear for the audience too, and the listeners to understand that each person's fear, it's the same, but it's different. Sometimes we can look at someone who, oh, you could just jump out of an airplane. You have such courage. And that's not a different courage as for someone who may say, I'm going to go live on my own. They may go, well, jumping out of an airplane is way scarier than that. Our fear is our fear and the courage and the positive step to take to overcome. And it gives us that exhilaration of life and gets us very excited. And I remember back in 08 and 09 when in the, the economy completely crashed and um, I'm raising children and I was going through a divorce. And, and I remember there was a moment of just overwhelming stress and everything I had worked for was going away. And, and I was worried so much. And I thought worrying and having sleepless nights and anxiety, all of this isn't helping me. And what you shared of just looking at that moment of fear in the mm-hmm. face. And one of my favorite books I read when I was 24 years old was Dale Carnegie, How to Stop Worrying and Start Living. Yeah. And one of the things that he shares in that book was, look at the worst possible case scenario. Drill it all the way down to say, what is the worst thing that could happen right now? And at that moment, I laughed and I thought, the worst thing that could happen is, okay, everything I worked for is gone but I will still have my health. I'll have my backpack. I'll have my children. And I'm going to pull out my goal folder because in my goal folder, I have the ADT, which is the American Discovery Trail that I've always wanted to do. It takes about a year coast to coast to hike. And I thought, okay, worst thing that can happen. We all get to hike the country for a year. I'm going to have the best stories ever. And as soon as I put it in that perspective, I wasn't as afraid. And I looked at it and I had excitement and I thought, okay, I'm not the only one going through this and we're all going to be okay. And then to keep moving forward. And for anyone out there, no matter what that fear is or what your goal is or what you're looking to achieve and accomplish, if it's fearful for you, don't compare yourself to someone else to say, oh, but they did that. So I'm a baby over here because this scares me. Your fear is real. And each time we face it and move through it, and as I say, burn through it, we get power and we get passion and we get excited and we realize what we can do. And then that next challenge and that next challenge, and then we are living a life passionately, purposefully with excitement and we are thriving rather than surviving. And I know somebody said that out there as a quote and I don't know where I stole it, but <laughs> it's it's how we should live our lives every day. And we just get so excited. One of the things that you you talk about that I love is the accumulation. And when I got to that part in the book, again, I was pumping my fist and so excited because I'm like, yes, that's positive forward motion. And it's the accumulation of those little steps and those little goals and those dreams, but to also for us to stop and understand that accumulation can be positive or negative. And we need to stop and decide where we're going to put our energies and to be aware for ourselves and our energy. Yeah, there's a story uh, maybe I can jump in here and share. Because even though I'd felt so, well, maybe because I'd felt so called to do the Atlantic or, you know, to row across these the three big oceans, I think I'd fondly imagined that the universe would go, here you go, Roz, I shall send you fair winds and following seas and everything's going to be lovely. And of course, it totally wasn't. Everything just went to hell almost right from the start. It was a very, very rough year to be on the Atlantic. Um, 2005 was the year of hurricanes Katrina, Rita, Wilma. It was it was a very very stormy year, and pretty soon everything started breaking. And even if you haven't been on a rowboat in the middle of an ocean, I'm sure you can relate to that feeling of just, oh my god, this is all just so much harder than I imagined. All four of my oars broke before halfway. Camping stove broke about two weeks in, so I had to eat all my food cold. The stereo broke. Later on, the satellite phone broke, so I lost all communications. Just everything that could go wrong did. And because I was out there, as I thought, you know, 
on a, on a mission, I'd answered the call to adventure. I was really indignant about this. I was like, what the hell? This was not the bargain. Right. The seas were supposed to part and the sunshine and the everything get calm. And listen, I listened to the universe. This is my passion now. Everything should go perfect, but it didn't. Yeah. It was such a slap in the face for me or a kick in the teeth or a punch in the gut. I was just struggling so much. And early on in the voyage, the combination of all of these things going wrong. Oh, and I also got tendonitis in my shoulders and I had saltwater sores on my bottom and, oh, it was just miserable. And um, I started skipping rowing shifts. I became completely overwhelmed by what I'd taken on. Um, I just looked at the 3,000 miles of rowing that lay ahead of me and just lost morale. I started to skip rowing shifts. I'd planned to row for 16 hours a day. Um, I wasn't even doing half of that. I was like, oh, this is so hard. I, I'm justified in skipping a shift. I'll make up for it later on. And eventually I realized that that was just not how I wanted to show up, that it was about consistency, as, as you say, the power of accumulation, that I had to, yeah, I was pretty hacked off with the ocean behaving the way it was behaving, but it wasn't personal against me. I had to just let the ocean do what oceans do. And I had to show up and do what ocean rowers do, which was to keep sticking my oars in the water. I realized I wanted to be able to look back at my time on the ocean and feel proud of how I showed up with with discipline and with persistence and with fortitude. And so I got into the groove of doing my doing 12 hours a day I never managed to do 16 but heck you know 12 hours of rowing a day is still quite a lot so I think I can let myself off the hook with that one so um that was just so important to me to get into the routine of the 12 hours a day and just consistently show up and and do that and the other thing that I wanted to say about that was uh we tend to maybe be quick to label things as good or bad. And certainly when I was rowing that first ocean, my perception was that it was, this was all bad, everything that was happening to me. And that caused me so much angst at the time. But And I would t- tell you, it took me a good 10 years to actually reflect on this with a bit more wisdom to look back on what ended up being a three and a half month voyage, uh, the last month of which I had no communications, to look back on everything that went wrong and to be grateful for it. Because if everything had gone beautifully smoothly with, you know, dancing dolphins and mermaids and all the rest of it, I would not have learned anywhere near as much as I did about how strong I can be when push comes to shove. So actually now I look back and I just, I thank the universe for every single one of those quotes, bad things that happened to me because I was a fundamentally different woman by the end of of that crossing. I knew that I'd pushed myself so far outside my comfort zone and I had lived to tell the tale and I had become so much stronger. So now when I'm getting bent out of shape about something and things don't seem to be going the the way that I want I just I keep the faith and and know that uh what doesn't kill me is going to make me stronger Uh, of course it's not always easy to have quite that degree of detachment at the time but I try and be a, a little bit less judgmental a bit less quick to apply those labels of good or bad to an experience recognizing that the times that felt the worst when they were happening actually were my greatest teachers Yes. And as we take that step in the direction and move forward and face that fear, because the passion is there, we uh, thank you so much for sharing that. And I've learned that along my journey. And for the listeners, it's take the step, move forward. It's not good or bad. And sometimes we throw in the towel. Uh, One of my reminders that I, I give myself and I share with my team quite often is just give a hundred percent of whatever percent you have. We don't always feel a hundred percent. We don't, oh, you know, on the days that we feel great and everything is going perfectly and we can give a hundred percent, woohoo, that's, you know, we move forward. But what do we do when we don't feel a hundred percent or everything isn't 
laid out perfectly for us. At that moment, give 100% of whatever you have. And what's amazing is we start moving up that percent ladder. So one of the things I love to share is if you start your day at 50%, stop and go, okay, I'm going to give 100% of that 50% I have. And usually by the time the day is over, you go, wow, I did more than I thought. Your day gets better because you pressed on and you continue to go. And with that moving forward and that sense of accumulation, I'd like to talk a little bit about how you have inspired me so much and the team at my office with the power of accumulation. As a young girl, I always felt a connection to the environment. I was very fortunate to have Um, a family and my grandfather, especially who taught me so much about our earth and our environment and respect. And as we move forward, we, we lose that a little bit. And, And I didn't realize that maybe I'm not looking at it as keenly as I should until we met and I'm reading your books and I'm watching your Ted talk. And I'm like, Oh girl, you got to go back and pay more attention because a story that, that resonated with me when I was a kid is I, I I raised guinea pigs and I used to put them out in the yard to play and and eat in the garden. And I remember I had a mom and babies and they were playing. And that night, my guinea pigs started, the babies were screaming and something was wrong. And one passed and then another and I was crying my eyes out. And I found out that um, the landscaper had been to the yard and it was the chemicals that they put in the yard. And I I just was, that was it. And I remember uh, uh, the next month when the landscaper came, here I was, I was a little girl, maybe eight, nine years old. I had my hands on my hip and I told them they were fired and they had to leave and they were never allowed back. And they called my dad (laughs) at his business and said, your daughter is not letting us do our job. And I I just took such a stand because it was, it was right there in front of me and I, and I saw what happened. And so I was always very cognizant about that and, and chemicals, putting chemicals in our earth and try to be as natural as I could. And, and when I started to learn about plastics and, and I, I pride myself, I travel a lot and I carry my reusable container to, you know, fill up and little things like that. But now that I've been exposed and in in a good way, my eyes have opened, I feel overwhelmed. I have that sense of feeling that I go to my hotel room and I'm like, they gave me water, but they gave me bottles of water. And everywhere I look now, I'm noticing the plastic and the bottles of water. And 60 Minutes just had an episode last week. And forgive me, I don't remember what island it was, but where they don't have any plastic at this island, but it is washing up. And when the birds are dying and decaying, what we're seeing inside, when they're decaying, what we're seeing is left is all of this plastic. So what I'm getting at is how we can feel this sense of overwhelming. And I know sometimes we can go, oh, my little moment here isn't going to make a difference. But I know that if we all do one little thing, that's an accumulation of positivity, and we can make our world better. And maybe a thought to the listeners to to remind us, you're going to feel that sense of overwhelming, but your little difference that you make is going to add up in a big way, and it's going to help us all. I do quite often get this comment from people. They're like, I'm just one person and there are seven and a half billion of us and um, maybe that country does it worse or my next door neighbor does it worse or whatever. But that thinking doesn't really help us very much. Um, And I absolutely like applaud and agree with what you're saying about it is that power of accumulation. And sometimes we just have to be the change that we want to see in the world. And yeah, of course, it helps if we can lead by our example. If when we're in the supermarket, and we're there with our reusable bag, and hopefully the person behind us in the line notices that we brought our own bag. And that starts to shift the normal that for them, they'll go, oh, heck, well, if she can bring her own bag, I'm sure I could do that too. When I get a little bit despondent, and I think for anybody who cares about the environment, it's easy to get despondent. I just remind myself about tipping points, that things are shifting. It may seem imperceptible, but gradually more and more people are getting with the program and starting to remember that 
actually, as humans, we are part of nature and we live in this ultimate closed loop system called planet Earth. And there is really no way, whether we're pumping out stuff into the air or into the soil or into the oceans, it does all come back to us in the end. And there's something both uh, sort of empowering and, and a bit terrifying about that. But any time that I feel, oh, heck, you know, is is there hope? I just have to trust that with my lifetime and, and my conversations like this one or just one-to-one with people, I've added my few straws onto one side of the, the balance and one day the scales will tip and there will be this, I hope, I trust this mass outbreak of common sense and we'll realise that we can't have a healthy future as humans without a healthy planet, that we are, our fate and the fate of the earth are completely inextricably linked. And this, I'm not talking like spiritually woo-woo here, I'm talking in a very real scientific practical way that our health depends on the health of, of our earth. And I look around and it's such a beautiful, such a beautiful earth. And it would be a shame if a few generations hence, if um, if people can't enjoy it the way that we've been lucky enough to. I agree. I agree. And thank you. And, and we all can make a difference one little step at a time. And you mentioned, you know, it's not just about pulling straws. And here I live in Southern California and most all the restaurants now that I go to, they don't offer straws. You have to ask. And if you ask for a straw, a lot of them have moved to paper straws. And I was like, oh, this reminds me when I was a kid. This is great. So every little shift and every little, again, positive forward motion step, that law of accumulation, we can make a difference and we can get the word out. When I just think of the power of this in my office, watching your TED talk and we took a break one afternoon and we listened to it. And if there's 15 people in my office that are going home and telling others and sharing it a little bit differently at work or bringing in their reusable glass bottle rather than plastic, it all really does add up. And you know what? I, I, I know there are some very real and very specific environmental challenges that, that we face. And at the same time, I, I think that fundamentally, we just need a, we just, <laughs> we seriously need a, a shifting consciousness. We need to be recognizing our responsibilities to each other and to the generations yet to come. Um, because if it wasn't the environment that we were messing up, then there'd be something else that we're doing, like the big problems with inequality in the world or challenges of social justice or, you know, th- there are so many problems out there that are symptoms of our failure to recognize that we're all connected with everything and everybody else and if we can get to that mode of thinking so we don't want to disrespect or to put down another person because doing that we recognize actually diminishes us as as a human being by the same token when we damage nature that diminishes us as people so it's really about shifting to living mindfully and consciously and recognizing that everything we do has consequences. And I know that can sound like a really heavy burden, um, but it's also tremendously empowering that we are creating our own future individually and collectively. And it's that kind of thinking that I think we really need to get to. I'm starting to sound a bit like John Lennon here. <laughs> if, if we're to have a, a peaceful and prosperous and sustainable world, then we, we need to see it as the whole being greater than the sum of the parts, that everything is connected. Well said. And, and to add on to that again, to talk about that power of accumulation, when we care for others and we care for our earth and we are kind, it all adds up because I, I have this saying that how we do anything is how we do everything. And when we stop and we are caring people because we care for each other or we're caring for our earth or we're caring about another's feelings. And it is that accumulation because you, we can't disregard one thing or disregard a human or just, and then not have that 
connection. And you're bringing so many things to light. And there's times we forget, and it's about picking up our heads and looking around and doing. I, you know, sometimes I want to go, I wish someone would do that. And I would laugh in our office and I'll say, Well, you're someone. We, you are someone. So if you see the trash, pick it up. When I walk and I see strangers, I always have my head up and I say hello. And it's fun because some people say hello and some don't, but it's not going to stop me from saying hello to other humans and giving a smile and being friendly. And it's not going to stop me from having the opportunity that if I see trash on the ground to pick it up or remember my bags or carry glass container and refill it opposed to plastic. And that little accumulation of caring and being good to one another and our environment is going to add up in a big way. And there's research that shows that when you're courteous to somebody else, um, actually it boosts their mood and they're more likely to pay it forward. So there's a very real and measurable ripple effect that every time you you do something nice for another person or good for the environment, it really, it, it does have this beautiful contagion. It, it really does impact on other people. And I suppose ultimately it comes back to doing our, um, like picturing our ultimate end and, and starting with that end in mind. When we get to the end of our time on this earth, how do we want to feel when we look back? How do we want to feel about how we showed up every day? Uh, do we want to feel proud of that or do we want to think, ah, oh, I actually could have done better? Why not start planning for that better right now? Exactly. And no matter where you are, what your age, your education, how you're feeling, how you grew up. The time is to start now. With this interview and reaching out to all of these listeners, I know it's going to help and make a difference. And if it's just one thing that that the listeners take away today and say, ah, oh, that's my positive forward motion step in the right direction, it absolutely has an accumulation effect and a ripple effect before we go, I, I do have a couple questions for you, Roz. Would you share with us what scares you? Ooh, um, a lot less than used to. <laughs> it's funny how you can get used to all sorts of things. Like I used to be absolutely petrified of public speaking. Even in my corporate life, if I had to speak up in front of three or four other people, I'd be red-faced and sweaty-palmed and shaking. But again, my motivation... To, to share my story became bigger than my fear. So what still scares me? <laughs> I don't want to say nothing, but, you know, there isn't really, there isn't really that much. Um, I'm not saying that I'm fearless, but I'm, I'm generally able to find a way to get around my fear. And if something's sufficiently important to me to, to do it anyway, I suppose, what I would say is I maybe what keeps me motivated to keep striving to be my best self is I do have what I think is a productive fear of getting to the end of my life and thinking actually my the last words I ever heard my dad saying as as he was passing away were oh I never got around to and I didn't you couldn't hear the end of his sentence, but I just don't want to feel that way at the end of my life. I want to feel that like I really got around to as much as it was humanly possible to get around to. Yes. And and if I could add to that, what, one of the things that, and I love that you share that, well, there's not too much I'm afraid of. And, and maybe it's the fear itself is what you're afraid of. Oftentimes I've thought, I don't want to be afraid. That's what scares me. What scares me is that fear itself is going to stop me and that I won't press forward and overcome. So it's that, okay, this scares me, but I've been afraid before. So what are the steps I need to take to burn through that fear to move forward? And what scares me is that having that fear stop me. <laughs> I want to be sure that I always remember to look at that fear and through stories like yours and, and others to look at that and go, okay, they did it. How do they do it? I can continue on. And I don't want to ever be debilitated by my fears. And 
it keeps us pressing, pressing forward. And if you could go back and talk to your younger self, what would you tell her? <laughs> oh, that would be a long conversation. Um, but I think the one thing that I would say to my younger self would be just don't care so much about what other people think of you. Mostly they're not thinking of you anyway. <laughs> they're much more busy thinking about themselves. And I've done some things that um, maybe I was afraid what other people would think about them. And it's felt important enough to me to go ahead and do them anyway. And as Dr. Seuss would say, those that mind don't matter and those that matter don't mind. Um, I, I know that I used to really spend far too much of my mental bandwidth worrying about what other people might possibly think about what I did or didn't do and trying to do the things that I thought they wanted me to do. And I, I've got a horrible feeling that this is how quite a lot of people end up living their lives is doing the things that they think other people expect or want them to do. It's not even what other people actually <laughs> want us to do. It's just what we think they want us to do. And I certainly used to run my life on those lines and it wasn't taking me anywhere good. So I think that in defense of selfishness, I think there's that sort of healthy awareness of what's going to make us feel happy and fulfilled and purposeful. And I found that since I started putting my own innate desires first, that I've been able to be a much more generous and thoughtful and loving friend because I'm okay. On the inside, I'm okay. I'm not needy. I'm not feeling like a martyr to somebody else's wishes. So it's actually, it's a win-win for everybody. So yeah, I would definitely say, don't worry too much about what other people think of you. Very good. And you said it perfectly in defense of selfishness. <laughs> and that is such a good one, especially working moms. I, I quite often remember running a business and raising two daughters and I would go off for a week on an adventure trip on my own where there were no cell phones and you couldn't plug in or do anything. And oftentimes people would look at me and say, how can you do that? And I would think, how could I not? This is who I am. This makes mm -hmm. me a better mom. It makes me a better wife. It makes me a better business owner. And if I listened to all the naysayers and how dare you, and I thought, my goodness, I'm leaving my children with their dad. I'm not leaving them abandoned somewhere. And it's very important to do what matters to us and be a little selfish and take care of you because to be uniquely you, you are a gift to the universe and you are a gift to others. But if we're trying to serve a purpose for someone else and please others, we're going to feel uncomfortable and not be able to be our authentic selves. So as we come to an end of this episode. And thank you again so much for being so gracious with your time. My pleasure. I always, if you could leave the listeners with, and I'm sure you're going to have so many, but one positive forward motion thought, what would that be? I think you kind of just said it actually, that I, I think that we've been maybe brought up in a culture where we aspire to be like other people. And something that really was pivotal for me in becoming the person that I am now, which is when I look back at who I was 20 years ago, wow, it's like night and day. The thing that's really helped me to do what I've done and become who I've become is to recognize that I'm unique and to stop wasting my time and mental energy wishing that I was somebody else. To recognize that I have unique gifts to bring. We absolutely all do as a product of our upbringing and our experiences and our worldview and our thoughts. There, for every single one of us, we have something really important that the world needs right now. And I think this is where the conversation on diversity really needs to go, that it's it's not about the color of your skin or your gender or your orientation or any of that. It's about you being uniquely 
you to the absolute best of your ability and bringing all of yourself to this life, uh, to what's happening in the world right now. You're here for a reason. We need to hear your voice. And I would especially like to say this to the women who are listening, because I think too often, even though we live in a culture that's often not friendly towards women's voices, we also often get in our own way. And we need to get over ourselves. It doesn't matter if we think we're not perfect or we're not supermodels or we don't have PhDs. We still have something really beautiful and important and needed right now. So listen to that inner voice that's that's asking you to express yourself. And please bring all of you to this lifetime. Yes. And listen to that inner voice and that good inner voice. (laughs) <laughs> you know, all the times I say, my goodness, if a friend talked to us the way we talk to ourselves sometimes, they would no longer be our friend. So be your own best cheerleader. So true. And to cheer each other on and coming together in collaboration and not competition. You're wonderful. And I want to thank you so much. I am so excited that we met and we had this opportunity to share this message and for all the listeners out there, keeping up that positive forward motion and shine. Be authentically you. We are so different, but we are so the same. And this universe is small and we can make that great difference. So Roz, thank you so much for your time today. It's an honor and a blessing and many blessings to you. My absolute pleasure. And thank you for the work you're doing in the world. And I've said this to you before. I just love your last name. Please, Denise, keep on scattering the good. The world needs you. Well, thank you. (laughs) Thank you again. Wow, what an honor for me to have the opportunity to visit with Roz and share with you all. She is a true inspiration of positive forward motion. And if you'd like to learn more about Roz, you can go to her website, rozsavage.com. That's Roz, R-O-Z, Savage, S-A-V-A-G-E.com. You can find her book, Stop Drifting, Start Rowing, and learn more about her conservation efforts. I hope you found today's message inspiring. And if you did, don't keep it a secret to yourself. Share, rate, and review. Thank you for listening. And remember to keep up the positive forward motion.